Hey, what's up? Welcome back to another live stream here on Free Will Photos. Today, we are going to be editing a black and white photo. Now, this black and white photo is actually a everyday photo, if you will, that I took of my daughter holding some chalk a few years back. Um, we'll take a look at the metadata to just see how long ago this was. But the goal of today's live stream and video is really to teach you how you can go about addressing black and white photography. It's not like the world's most profound piece of uh, imagery, but it is definitely a great subject matter for us to take a look at light and contrast and things of that sort. Now, if you would like to pick up a copy of All One Photo Raw, consider using my coupon code FREEWILLPHOTOS20. It'll save you some money at checkout, depending on what currency system you are on. You know, it'll save you some money. I won't say 20%. I'll just say that it'll save you some money. And I do make a small commission. Now, the good news is that's at no extra charge to you and you get to save some money. You get a great piece of software, like I always say. So let's go ahead and dive into the computer and take a look at what we can do to make black and white photos. All right, so here we are in the computer looking at the image. Uh, this was taken back in 2015. Now, this photo, my daughter was holding some chalk in her hand and I said, hey, you know what? just hold it there. Let me take a photo of it. And I wasn't really thinking much of it. I actually enjoyed the composition. I enjoyed what came of it. It's very clear subject matter. And these are the types of photos that black and white images really work well with because there's light and there's texture. These are two things that I always look for in my photos. How prominent is the light and how much texture is there in the image? Now, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it. This is a photo that I edited using Lightroom back in 2015 when I originally did this and said, hey, you know what? I can do the same thing using On One. So we're going to go ahead and go back to the browse and we're going to open up the actual file, the NEF or the native raw version of the image. And this is essentially what it was. So you can see that I had I cropped the image uh, a little bit, and we probably won't get into that today just because of uh, time. But what we will get into is converting this to black and white. Now, I know that I always say that you should start with Brilliance AI when you work in 2024 just because it's there, but when... What I'm finding right now, at least in my own personal experience, when I work with Brilliance AI, it's really great if I'm working in color. But when I want to go do something that I know for a fact it's going to turn to a black and white, uh, then I don't really use Brilliance AI because I want to control the way that those tones are really being manipulated. So the very first thing that I do is I just come over to the effects tab and I drop the black and white adjustment tool onto the image. Now, this shows me, like this gives me that representation. So the first step that I think everyone should do when you're working in black and white is just convert the photo to black and white. And I don't recommend doing it with the saturation by just coming over to the saturation and pulling that down. Uh, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll just show you real quick. So I'm in tone and color under the develop module. If I pull saturation all the way down, it gives the same appearance that there's black and white. But what I really did was I stripped all of the color out of the image. And that is probably, I mean, it's a way of making a black and white image, but you're not going to have very much control over the colors in the image. So instead, what I really like to do is push the saturation and the vibrancy up just because that gives me a little bit more control in the back half of the edit. So now we'll come back over here and turn on the black and white, and then we'll jump back over to tone and color because I do want to manipulate the tone and color globally, and then I'm going to focus in on manipulating it in very specific locations. So the first thing that I like to do is one, make sure that I have a good representation. Looking at the histogram, looks like I have a lot of information over here to the far right side. 
And if you don't know how to read a histogram, I'll give you a very rough uh, lay down of what it is. From the far left side, that's the blackest or the darkest points of your image. And then it goes across the grayscale medium all the way up until you get to pure white, which is going to be the brightest aspects of your image. All right. So essentially this area over here, if I hold down the J key, because it looks like we got some clipping, this area that's going off the chart here is representing this red area here. So holding down the J key, this area that is highlighted in pure red is represented by this giant peak over here. And you can tell that because when I hold down the J key, it actually shows up. Now, everything else is going to be represented throughout the rest of the histogram. The challenge with black and white images is making sure that you have both blacks and whites in your image. Now, that's just for me. I like to make sure that I have the full range represented in my black and white images, unless I'm going for a less contrasty image. But if I want that contrast in the image, then I need to make sure that I have that. So I'm just going to come over to my blacks and I'm going to pull that black point. And if you notice the edge of that histogram is starting to scoot over to the left here. Now, if I hold the J key down, I get the uh, indicators and, you know, just quick tip. If you don't want to hold down the J key, you can just click these little indicators here and they'll stay on. I personally just use the J key because I'm not as concerned about these indicators or this image getting blown out in the blacks and the highlights personally, because I'm going to, I'm not going to print this and this in my opinion, it really only matters if you blow out highlights in a black and white or uh, burn the sh the shadows or the darkest areas in a black and white if you plan to print it. But I'm not overly concerned about it because this is just probably going to stay on my hard drive or go on to Vero, which is just a digital platform. But that is something you want to keep in mind. Nonetheless, I want to pull down on this until I get... A good portion of this information over to the left. And for me, this is actually a really good starting point to start to hone in my black and white. So first step, put on the effect module to turn your image black and white so you can see what you're doing. And then you want to take a look at your histogram and figure out which direction you need to pull your information. Now, if I wanted to call back some of those whites, then I would pull down on the whites probably until I hopefully started to uh, recover some of that information. But I don't like what it's doing to the overall image. So I want those whites to stay as uh, burned as they were because I like how bright everything was. Okay, so the next step is texture. Now, there's a few ways that you can go about dealing with texture inside of On One. I personally enjoy using the tone enhancer under effects for my images. And that's just because I like using the detail slider versus using the... Um, the structure slider. I find that, you know, and I'll show you both. So I'm going to pull up on the structure slider here. I'm going to pull up on the structure slider, just like so. And you can see it's doing a pretty decent job at getting the structure um, going, you know, up on the image. And in fact, we're in 2024. So let me show you a different way. Uh, at least the comparison. I'm going to add an adjustment. We'll invert this mask so it goes over the entire image. And then I'm just going to pull up on structure here. This is going to give us the same effect as if I was working in the develop module. The only difference is I can turn this effect off and on. And it's not very prominent like that you can see. But let me go ahead and just call this structure, S-T-R-U-C-T-U-R-E. Just making sure I'm spelling things correctly. It's early in the morning. Uh, and then I will go to detail and I will crank up on detail. 
and I'll even add some clarity. And my computer is not keeping up. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is open up the layers pane here, and I'm going to just drill down real quick. And this is only so I can show you the difference between structure and clarity. So with the local adjustment and that local adjustment didn't actually rename here, but this is the structure one. And then I've only modified the detail and clarity on the tone enhancer that I have here on my screen. So I'm going to go ahead and click tone enhancer to turn that off. And I'm going to leave the black and white adjustment on, but this is with structure. And then if I turn this structure off, you can see what structure is doing to the overall image. And I have it cranked up pretty decent, but not like crazy high, right? Same thing with uh, the detail and clarity. But if I turn on the tone enhancer, you can see the image just pops that much more. Now, this is purely subjective and 100% up to you, however you feel like working with your image. But for me, I enjoy using the tone enhancer in this regard just because of the way that it actually works and the tools that I have available to me. But it doesn't just stop there, right? So what I typically do, and I'm just going to close the layers because we don't need those anymore. What I typically do is I work in the tone enhancer to really develop the global structure that I want. And then if I need to, I'll add more tone enhancers and really start to work on developing that structure. I only do this for my structure. All right. So let me go ahead and get this to where I might want it to be, maybe somewhere around there. And because this is more of just like a structure edit, uh, I'll probably pull down on my blacks just a little bit. And let's turn this off and on. It's always good to look at a before and after. And, you know, this is just helping build that contrast in the image and really draw the viewer's eye to these uh, pieces of chalk in my daughter's hand. Okay, so now that I have that set, uh, particularly where I want it, I think that the structure looks good. Now it's time to really start to hone in the light on the image. And the way that I prefer doing that is with local adjustments, all right? And there is going to be some back and forth, but I just want you to know that I do jump between effects and local adjustments on the tools that I'm using in order to get the black and white look. So I have an, a local adjustment. It is completely reset. And I'm going to call this burn because if you know anything about photography or the idea of making things darker and brighter, that technique is called dodging and burning. And with black and white images, I love to burn first because the areas of the image that are brightest are the ones that will be the most prominent in your overall photo. So what I'm going to do is just pull down on the exposure and this is going globally or over the entire image. I'm just going to pull down on the exposure here. And what's really cool is you can use blending options to really make this make sense. So what I like to do is click on blending and come over to my blend modes and just use the arrow keys to kind of filter through and see which one of these blend modes uh, may help me with modifying that dark section. And None of the uh, top ones are really helping me right now. However, I get to overlay and this looks pretty good. And then I also get the soft light and soft light looks really good as well. Uh, these are contrast blend options. So they help with separating the brightest areas from the darkest areas. And if you look at the histogram, how that histogram is jumping every time that I move into these blend modes, uh, that gives you that indicator of what's happening to the layer that it's actually manipulating. Um, 
And then, you know, I, I go through this entire section here just to see which one may work well. Uh, that This could be a cool effect if you want to go a little bit more artistic. But today, I think we're going to go with soft light. Soft light seems to be the most natural contrast rendering um, blend option. So I use soft light quite frequently. So I'm just going to go ahead and select that. And what I want to do is pull this away from the highlights. And the reason is because I don't want to burn those bright areas. I want those bright areas to stay intact. So I'm just going to pull where it says protect. Uh, if I pull up on this for the highlights, it's going to pull that out of the highlight area. And it's going to help me with making sure that those stay um, in intact. Hey, Tom, welcome. Thank you for uh, for hanging out with me today. Tom says hello or greetings. So let's go ahead and take a look at what happened without the uh, burn effect, just so that way we stay on, to or on topic here. So this is without the burn effect. This is with the burn effect. You can see how this is really starting to drive home the the edit, so to speak. And I really enjoy the direction that this is going in, but we can take it a little bit further. So now what I think it's time for is some local uh, dodging to really make those areas of interest pop out a little bit more. And then we'll probably do something of a vignette to kind of darken down the corner over here. In fact, we'll start with that. So let's just add an adjustment. And I like to use, like, since I'm only coming from this corner, I'm just going to go ahead and grab my masking bug. And I'll do a linear right. Click over here. And I meant to do linear left, so I'm just going to rotate this around really quickly, like so. And then I'll just drag it down until I cover that area. Because I don't really care for this big bright spot over here when the attention should be on the pieces of chalk in the center of the image. So... I'll go ahead and pull that down and then we'll come through here and see what we can make happen. I think that this will work out well for now because when I throw the vignette, it'll darken down those corners. And if we need to do something more to treat this corner, then I'll do that a little bit later. But for right now, I'm just going to go ahead and darken down the corner a little bit. And we're going to start focusing in on the primary subject here because I want to enhance that. All right, so we'll just relabel this corner, darken. That way we stay tidy. I need to do a better job at keeping my uh, adjustments labeled correctly. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to increase the exposure, the midtones, and maybe even the whites just a little bit. And with a brush, at 100% opacity, uh, and you could get more artistic with this, but for the sake of time, um, actually, you know what, not for the sake of time, I'm going to pull down on my opacity. I'm going to pull this down to somewhere in the 30s, all right? Yeah, we'll go about, we'll just go with 30. And all I'm doing is looking at areas that are bright on the image, and I'm just going to paint over them. And it's really subtle. And if I get to an area where, you know, like this area transitions really well into the shadow. So I don't really want to mess with this. However, this area up here at the top, maybe I want to blend that and make this area up here more bright. So what I'll do is make my brush size relative to the subject. And then I'm just going to click and drag. And you can see how it's making it brighter along the top here. Now, if you have a Wacom tablet, this might be a little bit easier to do, but I'm so used to using a mouse that I like using the mouse. Now, 
I want to make this a little bit brighter in some areas. So what I'll do is make my brush size a little bit smaller. And because I was painting with a 30% opacity, when I make another pass along here, I'm going to make this just a little bit brighter. Now, perceivably, you won't really be able to tell where this brightness is happening between uh, one area to the other. But what it does is it draws the viewer's eye into the thing that you really want them to see. And I want to highlight these areas. So I want to emphasize this little area right here as well. So I'll do that. And then maybe this little corner aspect over here. And I think that that's actually pretty good. I do like what's happening to the hand here, but I'm going to do that on a separate um, adjustment because I want to control that differently. So uh, with all that, and you know what? I might actually paint over into this area just a little bit and help draw some attention and sometimes it helps just to hover over an area and click on it like that little spot right there and you know just simple things right make things stand out that you want to have stand out and then uh, we're going to come through and we are going to burn this section over here so this is going to be uh we'll just call it chalk dodge yeah that way it's easier to understand so we'll add another adjustment and this one we're going to call hand dodge because i do want to work with the hands separately and i don't want the same type of dodging effect if you will on the hands as I do on the chalk. Instead, I want this to be more of a uh, mid-tone type of dodge. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull up on the mid-tones here. And I'm also going to pull up on the highlights because I want the hands to kind of uh, help with ushering in the viewer's eyes. And you could do that with either a positive or a negative vignette. Because I know I'm going to be dark on the outside edges of my image overall, I want to make my hands a little bit brighter. Uh, so we'll go ahead and paint this on and see where that puts us and then maybe make some adjustments. So I'm just going to go ahead and paint this around the hand here. And this is a very gentle and subtle adjustment. And I don't even need it over every aspect of the hand. I only need it over some aspects and I may do another pass on that particular hand or that portion of the hand. But you can just see how I'm working with the fingertips here and really making these kind of stand out in their own regard. Now, this bottom one, I'm not going to worry about. That's at the bottom of the frame and not too much attention really needs to be placed or emphasis needs to be placed there. But I will come over her her palm area maybe two more times and yeah I think that's starting to look pretty good over there so let's go ahead and turn off the hand dodge and turn it back on and you can see how that's just brightening these areas making it a little bit more um pop so to speak uh, but I'm losing some of the texture in her hand. So I'm going to go ahead and increase the structure because this might, this should give me what I need. I want the hands to be, uh, quite detailed. Um, let's pull down on the blacks. Maybe that should help with separating that. And we'll pull up on the contrast as well. Too much contrast, I think, is going on in there. So what I'll do instead, because that's starting to darken down the area and it's not making it uh, shine through the way that I want it to. So what I'm going to do is actually click on the mask. I'm going to copy this. And this is where you go 
you know, one of those back and forth moments. I'm going to go over to my effects. I'm going to add another tone enhancer. And I'm going to click here on the mask. And then I'm going to paste it. And you probably are catching on. I'm just going to come down here to the clarity and detail. And I'm going to increase it here and make that a separate adjustment because I prefer working with the clarity and detail. And I like what that's doing there. So now I can come back to my local, go to my hand dodge. Let's get rid of the structure that's on here. And I want to brighten this area up, but again, more of a mid-tone adjustment. So I'll pull up on the mid-tones, pull down on my blacks. That helps with some of that contrast. And in fact, this may be a, a good candidate instead of a structure adjustment and tone enhancer. Let's go with dynamic contrast. And then we'll just paste the mask on. into that area. Let's go with Surreal. Yeah. So this is without the adjustment and this is with the adjustment. It's quite uh, profound. It makes a huge difference uh, overall. And I might increase the highlights, pull down on the blacks. And then when it comes to contrast, I just need to find if these hands are more in the medium or in the large. And I think it's actually in the small. So, and you also got to remember, if I hit the letter O, my mask is not painted in at 100%. So I can go a little bit more heavy handed with the way that I actually apply this. Now, if I wanted to, I could paint over this a little bit more and really start to hone in. Uh, that look so I can paint this in on those hands and really start to get that texture and contrast developed in a way that is separate from everything else. All right. So I won't spend too much more time on that, but that is the idea of if I turn this off and turn it on, you can see it's just drawing more attention and uh, texture out of those hands. And I could paint this in on the chalk as well, but I want that to be its own layer. So I'm just going to call this uh, hands texture increase. So and, you know, some of you are probably thinking like, Chris, how is this basic? Well, in my mind, this is basic because uh, this is how you start to really develop the black and white image overall. Even though we are going a little bit more in depth with all these uh, layers, I think I have what, uh, four here and then... I'm not using this one. So three here. So I got seven layers already on this one image and we haven't really modified much. Uh, but notice I haven't actually started working with the color. And, you know, for the sake of time on this particular uh, live stream, because I do have to end it in about 10 minutes for the sake of time. I'm going to say that I like the way that the texture is coming through, but your image and whatever your work is, you may have to, you know, really hone in on that a little bit more. Now we're going to click on the black and white adjustment and we're going to see if we can modify any of these tones now, or I'm sorry, these colors, because I think we got the tones where we want them to be, but there are underlying colors and we're going to use the color response to really start to hone in on this. Let me go ahead and turn off the black and white adjustment and don't worry about the way that, you know, this all looks now because we know what it looks like in black and white. What I really want to make reference of here is I have a yellow with some blue, maybe green. This is definitely green and this is more red. But look, I have red on the fingertips here. 
So when I start to modify red, I need to take a look at the fingertips as well. Uh, and then we got blues and obviously uh, oranges and browns in her arm and in her hand here. All right. So now when I turn on the black and white, I know kind of what colors are already here in the image and what I need to pull up and down to kind of make that look. So with the reds, I know that the reds were in her hand and on her fingertips. So if I push this up, we should see those get brighter. Well, I have to ask myself, do I want those areas to be brighter or do I want them to be a little bit darker? Now, a lot of people, they would use the black and white adjustment to do this. I personally, because I like to mask my my stuff in and have more control. And I do think, again, this is part of the basics, but it could be more advanced is I like to use a color adjustment. You could use a color enhancer, uh, which it's essentially the same, but I personally like to use the color adjustment um, because it's more simplified and I don't have to like, all I really want to do is work on my color responses. So now with the red, if I increase this, or maybe it's the saturation on here. Now, why aren't, oh, you know what? Because it needs to be underneath the black and white adjustment. In order for this to work, you got to put it underneath the black and white adjustment. So now let's go ahead and reduce that. So now you can see uh, I have the ability to modify everything here. All right. So I can pull up on the brightness for my reds and let's see how far I want that to go. Maybe, maybe something like this. And if I turn this off and on, I can kind of look and see where that's going. Now, ultimately, I think that that works well. But what's also cool about using a color adjustment is you can modify the range so if I don't like the range of what red is being pulled into this particular adjustment, I can pull that up. So let me make a very drastic adjustment here. And so this is with range 100% up. If I turn this off and turn it on, you can see it's really coming through this piece of chalk going all over the hands here, going through, uh, or I'm sorry, the fingertips and the palm of the hand. And as I pull the range down, you can see it kind of hones everything in and only focuses on very specific areas of red. So this is one of the reasons why I enjoy using the color adjustment with my black and whites, because I get more control over the way that my colors are being uh, represented in the overall image. Now, I think personally, the reds, because the fingertips need to be a little bit brighter, I am going to pull down on the brightness of the reds, but I'm going to remove it from the fingertips. So this is where that masking comes in. I can click on my mask and with a brush, I can just paint this away. Oh, let's go. Ahead. I'm going to go a hundred percent away. So I got to bring my opacity back up and then I'm just going to, paint this away from those areas because I don't need that red adjustment going through the fingertips. I'm okay with it everywhere else, but I don't want it on the fingertips. So if I turn this off and on, you'll see that my fingertips, let me make it more prominent. So we'll brighten that up. If I turn this off and on, you can see that it's just making those, like it's not making much of a difference on the fingertips. It is on this one back here. So let me just click that away. And I think that it's okay if it's not 100% perfect because that gets to that artistic style, if you will. So turning it off and on, you can kind of see what's happening here. Um, let's go ahead and turn this back on. 
And then I just want to pull this down because I want to make those reds a little bit darker. And now it's not coming through the way that I want it to. So maybe I will pull it back up. But we'll leave that there and we'll just call this red adjustment. And so now the last thing that I'll do uh, for this particular image is I'm just going to go ahead and throw on a vignette because I could spend a lot of time just going through and honing in on those colors. And hopefully that's given you an idea. I just kind of wanted to do an overview here. Um, but the last thing that I would do is I would come to local adjustments and throw on a vignette. Hit the letter M to get my masking bug and I'll go with vignette. Click here. It's going to darken those outside uh, corners. Now, with this vignette, I'm going to make it pretty tight to the chalk itself because, again, I want this blend or uh, the feather to kind of fade over the entire image. And I think I'm actually going to make it in the same direction as the chalk. So the light kind of follows through with uh with what's going on so i'll make my vignette about here maybe pull it down some this is purely subjective and your image may look different and then i'm just going to spread out this vignette to get that hand more involved and i think this is the final look that i would go for and I can't spell vignette, so I'm just going to go vig like that because I know what that means. All right. And I did not name these as well, uh, especially those two, but whatever. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at this is what we came into the editing bay with. And this is what we ended up with overall. Now. Anyone who's been watching my content knows that whenever I make a black and white, I always add a simple white border. It's just a personal preference when I'm working in on one. I like it. It's fun. It's almost become, or it has, it is a part of my signature whenever I edit a black and white and on one. So if you ever see an image from me uh, that's in black and white and it has a border around it, you know exactly which uh, program I use to edit that in. So hopefully you found some value in today's content uh, with the black and white edit. Now, I could go for a very long time and black and white photography is very, very technical um, in some cases. And, you know, that's kind of why I labeled this the basics. All I did was some dodging and burning. I added some texture and those are basic aspects to uh, making a black and white image. We could have gone with creating a uh, focal contrast of uh, blurring some aspects. We could have added some glows. Uh, there's a few more things that we could have done that escaped my mind at the current moment, but hopefully the basics that I was able to share with you today get you started and get you inspired to go and explore the world of black and white inside of on one. Now, if you got questions or comments, please let me know in the comment section uh, what those are. But I'd love to know what your black and white philosophy or workflow kind of looks like. Is it similar to what I just did? Uh, would you use Brilliance AI on your own black and white photography? Because in this video, I did not do that. So I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. And until the next time, I want you to stay inspired and keep creating. Peace.